Welcome to a new history of Old Texas. I'm Brandon Seal. On the night of August 17th, 1813, the Republican Army of the North bivouacked somewhere near the Medina River, about 15 miles south of San Antonio. Their scouts had been following the advance of a Spanish Royalist Army for almost a month now, as it marched toward them to put an end to their self-proclaimed republic, and those scouts had just returned to camp with the news that the enemy was just a few miles away. The Royalist Army not only outnumbered the ragtag Republican Army, it far outstripped it in terms of training and equipment. Its 1,830 men were commanded by an elite educated officer corps, many of them veterans of the previous decade's Napoleonic Wars. Two-thirds of the Royalists were mounted, heirs to the high equestrian traditions of the Iberian Peninsula and armed with lances and quick-firing carbine rifles. The men in this Royalist army in particular had spent the last three years crushing Mexico's fledgling independence movement as a unit and had won for themselves a fearsome reputation. Though short on supplies, and in some cases even clothing, they faced the South Texas August sun with a confidence and eagerness that even their one-eyed general could see. That general, Joaquin de Arredondo, was himself a 20-year veteran of military commands throughout the far-flung Spanish Empire. That he had chosen to lead this expedition personally, however, suggested the magnitude of the threat posed by this Republican Army of the North and Little Frontier San Antonio to continued Spanish rule in the Americas. The 1,400-man Republican Army, by contrast, was an improbable mix of Tejanos, Native Americans, and volunteers from the United States. The Tejanos, who constituted a majority of the force, stood out in their short-crowned, wide-brimmed felt cowboy hats, quote, sombreros de fieltro de anchas alas y aplastada copa, end quote, their high-shanked leather boots and their pommeled saddles. They made quite the impression on these early American immigrants to Texas, as did the painted Apaches and Tonkawas riding alongside them. For many of the Americans, it was the first time they had encountered this sort of frontier style, and you can almost feel their admiration for it through the ages. They also admired the Tejano's horsemanship. Our image of Anglo-Americans in Texas is strongly tied to the horse and the cowboy, yet we must remember that at this time, Anglo-Americans had not yet learned to, quote, ride like Mexicans, end quote, as historian Stephen Harden puts it. Americans were still principally woodsmen and accustomed to doing their fighting on foot, and so made up almost the entirety of the infantry in the Republican Army. Tejanos, by contrast, refused to do almost anything on foot, and Spanish observers frequently mocked them for this and their other pretensions to grandeur arising from their silly little ranchos and high-seated saddles, which were, technically, the prerogative of Spanish nobility. Yet despite their motley appearance and numerical disadvantage, the Republican Army of the North was probably the favorite going into the battle. They were fighting on their own soil, and they had not yet lost a contest. In the last six months, they had three times routed better-trained and better-equipped Royalist armies by employing the hard-charging, quick-strike techniques of mobile warfare that Tejanos had perfected over the previous century in their never-ending battles with the Plains Indians. And now, 100 or so of those Plains Indians lined up alongside 900 Tejanos and 400 or so American volunteers, inspired by the spirit of 1776 to spread their gospel of liberty across the continent. And on the morning of August 18th, 1813, they marched out together, Tejano, Native American, and Anglo-American, shoulder to shoulder, to fight in what remains the largest, bloodiest, and most underappreciated battle in the history of Texas. The outcome of this subsequent Battle of Medina ensured that centralism and statism remain the dominant political impulses in Mexican politics, even as it previewed the fault lines within Mexican society that have so often destabilized it since. The battle permanently severed the loyalties of most Tejanos to dictatorial regimes in the Valley of Mexico, and the aftermath of the battle impoverished Texas, making it the poorest state in the soon-to-come Mexican nation, and sent hundreds of Tejano families fleeing into the United States, where they established important cultural ties that would later mature into a revolutionary brotherhood. Yet today, we don't even know where this battle took place. In fact, in episode 11 of the first season of my podcast, A New History of Old San Antonio, I got it really wrong. I placed the Battle of Medina, quote, somewhere in the area between modern-day Lytle, Somerset, and Von Ormy, end quote. That was probably off by about 15 miles or so, 
And yet the fact is that no one in modern times has been able to find artifacts that can definitively confirm the site of the largest, bloodiest battle in Texas history. People have their theories, of course. Historians Ted Schwartz and Robert Tonoff, in their book Forgotten Battlefield, rescued this battle from obscurity 30 years ago and convincingly demonstrated that it had not occurred on the Medina River, where a battle marker had been placed in 1936. Other history buffs, like Dan Arellano, Robert Marshall, and Bruce Moses, to name a few, have conducted their own research, and some have placed their own markers. No less than three markers now currently stand near the Bear Atascosa County line, claiming to be the site of the Medina battlefield. Yet none of these sites have ever produced archaeological evidence of the battle. Tantalizingly, people used to know where it had taken place. The bleaching bones of the dead lined the road near the battlefield for almost a decade. Stephen F. Austin marked it on all of his maps. José Antonio Navarro and Antonio Menchaca all reference it in their memoirs. We have, in fact, almost a dozen quasi-contemporary accounts of the battle, yet almost each one contradicts the others in some frustrating detail. Over the course of the last year, a team of volunteers, including myself, have scoured the archival records for clues as to the exact location of this battle. We've interviewed local residents of the area, studied the work of others, sent out mailers, given away bandanas from the first season of this podcast as meager enticement for people to come forward, and knocked on more doors than I care to confess. We've gotten close, very close, we think, to finding the battlefield. As we narrowed our search area, we discovered that we weren't alone. We joined forces with other groups sniffing around the same spots we were, all of us committed to finally identifying the location of this historic event and united in the belief that the time had come to put this mystery to rest. And yet after months of collaboration, we've concluded that we need the help of the community. We've decided to publish everything we know in the hopes that it might inspire someone to come forward with some new piece of information or some new interpretation to help crowdsource, for lack of a better word, the exact location of this lost battlefield. So over the next few months, we'll share what we know about the Battle of Medina, about the First Republic of Texas, and about the search for the battle site itself on the Rivard Report and on this podcast feed. I invite you to check each episode's webpage on the Rivard Report, where we'll be posting maps, photographs, and other supplemental information. And please, please, comment, leave us reviews. We welcome your ideas and suggestions. The only way that we're going to be able to solve this mystery is with your help. Longtime listeners may note that we've also changed the name of the podcast as well, from a new history of old San Antonio to a new history of old Texas, because the topic that we're going to cover this year is bigger than just San Antonio. Frankly, it may even be bigger than Texas. This is one of the most cinematic moments in the history of North America, with Tejanos, Native Americans, and Anglo-Americans standing side by side against the forces of oppression and offering their lives for the dream of liberty. That their valiant efforts ended in so much bloodshed only heightened the battle's importance to contemporaries and left a lasting impression on the residents of the town that nearly disappeared in its aftermath, our beloved San Antonio. By comparison, the neighboring United States wouldn't experience so bloody a day until their civil war 50 years later. This is the first chapter of the war for Texas independence. And like the battlefield of Medina itself, it's been overlooked for too long. Join us as we attempt to remedy that in our new series, Finding Medina. Mm-hmm.